welcome to the Personal Pension Radio Podcast, where it's all about helping you complete your financial journey to retirement. Discover time-tested strategies and get unconventional insights into wealth building and retirement that actually work. Break away from the herd and go for the retirement you dream of. And now, here's your host, the income engineer, Craig Strom. All right, back on Personal Pension Radio, episode 168. Uh, Hopefully you are seeing the title of the episode gives you an idea of what I am going to talk about today. But I am the income engineer broadcasting from the personal pension radio workshop here in Southern California. Now, I was actually, as I prepared for the show, I was laughing about something that... uh, Gosh, I don't know when it was, what episodes uh, timeline this was, but I had said in my intro that I was broadcasting from the Personal Pension Radio Tower, high on the 95th floor of the Personal Pension Radio Tower in uh, downtown Corona, California. Now, for those of you who don't come from Southern California, uh, you won't necessarily get the joke, but think about this. Uh, Certified financial planner, Craig Strom, personal pension radio tower, 95th floor in a town called Corona. Well, the funny story is there that I think maybe the highest building at the time maybe had 10 floors in the city of Corona, and there is no way there was a 95th floor, so everybody knew that it was just me joking around, and yet... It still came up on the radar uh, for someone in the uh, compliance department saying, that is a boastful claim, a boastful claim that you were on the 95th floor, and it is a misrepresentation because you are boasting, you're not on the 95th floor of any building. Okay, folks, that's how serious it gets when you're a certified financial planner and an investment advisor representative, and you're actually a real financial planner with regulations to follow. I was not able to say I broadcast from the personal pension radio tower. So I actually am broadcasting from my studio workshop, my wood shop in uh, my on my property here in Southern California. So tells you how crazy the world is when it comes to being a certified financial planner. My mission is to deliver that retirement dream that Wall Street promised, but they just have not delivered. They still are not delivering. And I read another article today in my financial planning magazine, a survey of financial advisors, and they're still recommending, on average, most of them are still recommending the 4% withdrawal rate, 4% withdrawal rate on on retirement funds. Folks, it's amazing to me that although the data is out there, the economists have spoken, the people who know the math have spoken, there's still the majority of financial advisors on Wall Street are telling their clients that their retirement income withdrawal rate should be less than 4% or 4%. It's crazy, folks. These these numbers are wrong. It's flawed retirement advice, and yet it is still pervasive in the financial advisory community. My goal is to help you pull back the curtain and ask questions. Ask your financial advisor, how do you plan to help me avoid the 4% withdrawal rate in retirement? How do you plan to make that happen, right? Because optimizing retirement income, does not happen with a product like uh, investments or life insurance, real estate, 401ks, annuities. Roth IRAs don't fix it. None of these things will fix retirement income if your goal is maximum retirement income. If your goal is to retire in mediocrity and maybe struggle a bit, talk to a standard financial advisor who will say, well, maybe you should draw 35 or 4% out of your retirement savings. Well, that's great. I worked all this time, and now you're telling me I should basically take a huge cut in pay and struggle through retirement. I want to turn the light back on at the end of this retirement tunnel. You just have to be willing to stop following that conventional mainstream advice because it's not getting people there. It's not working. Quick disclosure, because I got a lot of stuff to talk about here. I am not an attorney. I am not a certified public accountant. I am a certified financial planner professional and 
a registered investment advisory representative and a chartered financial consultant. I've got letters and numbers all after my name. It's all good stuff, but don't act on advice or things that you hear on this show as if you are hearing things for your personal situation. We've got to talk first. Please don't act on things without meeting with a real, qualified, licensed financial planner. And dear goodness me, don't take advice from financial entertainers like Dave Ramsey or others who are not licensed to actually practice. They have no regulatory oversight to watching out for you and your best interest. So that's my take on that. Quick shout out to Dan in Blackfoot, Idaho for sending in the topic for today's show and maybe several other shows. Really hit me with a great email, great question, good reminder, love it. Shout out to Dan in Blackfoot, Idaho, really appreciate it. Now, the first segment, Watch Your Step. Last week, I touched on a conversation between two real estate financiers. And both of them had received multi-million dollar investment checks from Wall Street firms with no paperwork signed, no contracts, no paperwork. The Wall Street firm had sent millions of dollars to invest in their real estate program, their loan and real estate program with no paperwork. They just sent, one of them was eight and a half million dollars wired, just wired into the account with nothing. Remember, folks, it's uh, there's still some crazy Wild Wild West stuff happening out there, and you might want to go back and listen to last week's episode to get the full details and my take on that. This week, I want to say something that, that came up recently as I was talking with one of my clients that's been with me for a number of years, and it's this. Don't rely on your financial planner to be more excited about your financial future than you are. Hear me on this, folks. As much as I try, I cannot stay on top of every client's priority items. Those priorities change daily sometimes. And you have to be more passionate about your financial success than your financial advisor. That is just a fact. Your financial planner works with sometimes 100, 200 individuals. Maybe your financial planner works with more, but they work with individuals and families and nonprofits and businesses, right? They also, as I do, have their own family and financial house to think about. You cannot rely on your financial planner to be more interested and passionate about your financial success. You've got to take an active role. If you sit back and just be passive about things, you will get passive and lackluster results. Whether you've got an awesome financial planner like me, my opinion, folks, um, or not. So, Don't rely on your financial planner to be more passionate about your situation than you are, right? This resulted from a call with one of my clients where I had to remind him that I am ready. I'm excited. I want to help, but I am not going to continue to, to be, I cannot be more passionate about this than he is. And he actually apologized to me for all of his delays. He apologized for his procrastination. He agreed. He said, yeah, Craig, you're right. I do need to get involved. I need to schedule time. We need to do this. That's the reality, folks. You've got to be more passionate about your success than your financial advisor, right? It's just, that's just a reality. So watch your step with that. Maybe that's your situation. Maybe you're just kind of rolling through things and you're just relying on someone else and putting the burden and the responsibility off on someone else, not realizing that there's no possible way that they're going to be as excited about it as you might be. Because it's not their retirement, right? They're working on theirs, their financial advisor, your financial advisor has to work on his or her retirement as well, right? They're going to be more passionate about their own financial future, right? Even though your success is going to contribute to their success, et cetera, et cetera. I just want you to remember that, folks. Please, if you're in that complacent laissez-faire, laissez-faire, how the heck do you say that, situation, 
You've got to get up and take action. You've got to go out and be proactive, right? You've got to do it. Now, don't forget, watch your step. I'm going to keep reminding everybody, freeze your credit. Freeze your credit every time. It's like every week. How secure is this, Craig? Um, E-Money. I I offer E-Money to my listeners and my clients. E-Money is a great online financial resource with with, uh, financial planning and data aggregation. It's amazing. You can look at your whole world in one place. It's awesome. And the question is always, how secure is that? Well, it's as secure as anything nowadays, which is not secure. If you think about it, everything, including the most powerful banks in the world and the federal government and Equifax, have all been hacked. So how do you protect yourself? It's not just LifeLock, folks. Freeze your credit. Freeze your credit. It's easy. It costs 20, 30 bucks, 10 minutes. It's easy. Freeze your credit. Send me an email, Craig, K-R-A-I-G, at CraigStrom.com, and I'll send you the links. I actually send them out uh, many times last week to listeners who asked for the links. I'll send you the links. Freeze your credit. My, my daughter's actually freezing her credit because she's been procrastinating, even though I sent it to her a long time ago. I said, hey, did you get that done? Uh, no, I, I went into finals and I, I didn't do it. Freeze your credit, folks. Now, listener question, segment two. Uh, last week, um, I, I had answered a question about someone who was going to open a 401k plan uh, at the recommendation of their CPA, but... They already had another retirement or another company. They had multiple companies that they owned. And the CPA said, well, that's okay. Just open a 401k at this other company, and then you won't have to make any contributions for those other employees over there. Folks, that is wrong, 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 wrong. Huge mistake. If you want to hear the details on that gigantic 401k mistake, potentially, that was averted by asking me a question, which was great. Go back and listen to the last episode, 167 there, and I go into more detail. Now, this week, questions from Dan, okay? This actually came in from my uh, listener, Dan, that I mentioned uh, a shout-out to earlier. And there's multiple pieces to this, and I'm just going to go as long as I can. um, And some of these items I'm going to pick out and, and come back to on future episodes, okay? Because... The, uh, the detail necessary uh, might make sense to do individual specific uh, podcasts on some of these topics. So some of them are going to be super short. Some of them are going to be a little deeper. But I love the depth. Uh, Dan is thinking about his kids and, and his, his overriding idea here was that, hey, you talk a lot about retirement, but what about people in like their 30s and 40s who, you know, they got a long ways to go and they got kids and trying to teach their kids smart financial financial, uh, you know, principles, right? So we start off with this. Dan says, I want to help. I want help with my kids. Yeah, me too, Dan, by the way. Uh, I have a 21-year-old and and I will lease her out, you know, maybe for physical or manual labor there on the farm. Uh, she definitely needs to get back to uh, remembering manual labor. It's been a while since she's been under my roof. But anyway, Dan says, how do I start them off a pa- on a path of financial stability? There are common areas a parent can help their child succeed with the future, such as, and then he says, goes into this, staying out of debt. All right. So here's my take on staying out of debt. And I've had these conversations with my Madeline, but I am revisiting all of these things because I haven't laid on her too heavy while she's in college. I've, I've not given, given her a bunch of this conversation while she's in college so that she can stay focused on these things. But even when she was in high school and even younger, we had financial conversations. As you can imagine, her dad is a CFP, right? So Dan starts off with a question about staying out of debt. Yes, Absolutely. Staying out of debt, but to be clear, staying out of credit card debt, unsecured, non-productive debt, things that are like car debt, credit card debt, um, any number of things, store credit card debt, but not all debt is bad. I think one of the best things that we can teach our kids financially, one of the most advantageous things you can teach your children is the value 
of other people's money. The value of the proper use of leverage, the proper use of debt. And let's be clear. I guess maybe I should, as I'm thinking about this, let's be clear. Let's teach them what debt really is. From a business perspective, if you have $100,000 in the bank and you have $50,000 in a loan, your business is technically in equity position, not in debt. You have a loan outstanding, but you are in an equity position. If the role, if this, the numbers were reversed and you have $100,000 in loans and you have $50,000 in the bank, your balance sheet would show a negative. You are in debt. Teaching your kids the value of loans and that the, the lending facilities that are out there, banking and otherwise, is huge because the power brokers in this world, whether they're real estate, banking, finance, Wall Street, whatever it is, they all understand how to leverage other people's money properly. They, that is just a commonality. It's out there. It's something that is, is just not taught because what we are taught is debt is bad. Well, no, no, no. Debt is not bad. Loans that are on credit cards for a pair of jeans, I have actually met someone that went to a store after having one too many beverages, adult beverages at a conference, went to a high-priced retail store in the uh, Dallas, Texas area, let's just say that, very high-priced area, after having one too many adult beverages and whipped out his credit card and didn't pay attention that he had actually paid $200 for a shirt. One shirt. It just boggles the mind. He he just throws his credit card off. This is a young guy just out of high just out of college. He has no value for that credit card. No no connection to really what damage it can do. So, yes, managing debt, managing credit cards, things like that for sure. But teaching your kids for example, the value of a 30-year mortgage. Teach your kids the value of a 30-year mortgage instead of a 15-year mortgage so that they are empowered with knowledge when they get to that point someday when a banker or a spouse or somebody's talking about, hey, let's buy a house together. We got to get a 15-year mortgage because that's what I heard on the radio. They need to be empowered with the knowledge to know what the true value of connecting all the dots of a 30-year mortgage is as opposed to a 15-year mortgage. Those types of things where that is a great use of other people's money. Okay? Great use of debt, if you will. I have and keep and will keep reminding my daughter about the economics of collateral lending, right? Being able to lend through an institution using another asset as collateral. Real estate is a big collateral lending thing that everybody knows. But most people don't know that you can actually have collateral in a whole life insurance company and you can borrow from the life insurance company without borrowing your own money. Most people don't know that they can have investment accounts with investments in those investment accounts, and they can borrow from the financial institution without touching their own money in the investment accounts. Most people don't understand collateral lending at all. That is an enormous benefit, economic benefit, to teach our kids. And it's an area that I will definitely touch on some more for sure. Another big one, a lesson that I teach all the time, whenever I can. I'll teach it to CPAs. I'll teach it to uh, kids. I teach it in high schools. Uh, when I go see the uh, senior class every year at my local high school, I teach banking 101. How does a bank make money, right? I teach how does a bank make money and the, um, and the amount of profit that a bank makes making loans is unbelievable, folks. It truly boggles the mind. But teaching your kids banking 101, just really making sure they understand the underpinnings and the mechanics of the financial system, that is a big, big deal. Now, Dan goes on to ask about 
how do you teach them how to spend less than what they make? Well, I have to tell you, this was a tough one for me in, in my situation raising up my, my Madeline, right? We had a blended family with moms and stepmoms and grandmas and stepgrandmas. And, you know, we had all these people in there that were subsidizing Madeline's young life, meaning she really didn't want for anything. You know, she could, she knew that she could manipulate grandma number one and grandma number two. And, you know, sure enough, she would end up with a new pair of jeans or, you know, she'd end up with a, you know, a, a tickets to the movies or she was subsidized by all of these divergent, you know, family members. She wasn't subsidized by me and my wife. Uh, I am remarried to my infinitely fantastic, patient, lovely wife, Amy, who has been just an awesome, awesome stepmom uh, for Madeline. And Amy and I were pretty consistent examples for Madeline. Now, it's really hard, though, to know what sinks in. You know, that spending less than what you make is something that Amy and I were completely comfortable with. We, we teach it. We demonstrated it as much as we possibly could. And that's the key to all of this, folks, is you have to demonstrate it, right? You have to demonstrate this stuff. My, my Madeline grew up in a house where for most of her life, uh, she, we did not have cable TV, because my wife and I, my wife Amy and I, we refuse to spend 60, 70, 80 bucks. I know some people have spent over $200 a month on TV. Really? We don't. We got Netflix and Amazon Prime. That's, uh, and you know, YouTube and stuff. We'll watch funny things. We watch DVDs on Redbox, right? There's no reason to spend money on that. So Madeline grew up hearing, hearing conversations about where Amy and I and how Amy and I spend our money and what we're going to buy. And no, 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 we're never, ever going to buy a new car, right? Madeline watched me uh, shop for a, a truck, a used vehicle to find a deal so that I would never pay retail for a vehicle, right? She learned that. She learned when we shopped for her own car, first car, that we would never pay full retail for a vehicle. She learned that. But again, like I said, it's hard to know what sinks in. So the best you can do is to set a great example and make sure to include your children in the adult conversations about money. And don't, don't sugarcoat anything. Just speak clearly. Just talk clearly. Explain things as necessary. And, and I'll say this. Last year, Madeline blew me away. Because remember, like I said, you never know what sinks in. So I went to visit Madeline in Flagstaff where she is going to school. And she said she wanted to take me out to a restaurant. And I said, hey, that's great. She's going to take me out to a restaurant, right? That's awesome because she's making her own money. And, and I am subsidizing her somewhat, but um, it's nice that she's going to take me out. Well, we got to the restaurant that she'd never been to, and she looked at the menu, and then she looked at me and said, would you mind if we went to a different restaurant? Because the prices here are way too high, and, and it looks like the portions are really small. I was so proud. I was just beaming. I was like, heck yeah, we could get up and head on out of this overpriced restaurant. And I love the fact that she has that ingrained in her brain. That is me. Who knew that she was paying attention, that that became something that just became part of her personality when it comes to spending money? Now, I'm not saying that that's it's permeated all parts of her being, but wow, that was fantastic. So spending less than what you make, the only way you're going to get that message in is to talk about it, to share conversations, involve them in adult conversations at, at all throughout their life. And you'll be surprised, I suppose, maybe like I was, that some of this stuff will set in. It'll, it'll get in there. Dan goes on to ask about how do you get them to set aside savings? That is another really tough one. Now, please, I'm going to stop and say, folks, please leave your comments. Send an email to me. Give me your comments and your feedback on, go to my Facebook page, LinkedIn. Love to hear it. But what I'm saying is, I'm not an expert. I, 
I had I have I have one shot to get it right, and uh, so far Madeline hasn't been arrested. Thumbs up. I'm doing all right. You know, <laughs> it's all good. Okay. But Dan goes on to say, well, how do you teach them to set aside savings, right, to pay themselves? Well, again, as a young person, you know, when they're young, you have to lead by example. You've got to just drag them along. So, for example, my daughter, whether she liked it or not, my daughter was responsible for all of the bottles and cans recycling in our house and at her mom's house. She was re responsible for all bottles and cans. And she would have to gather them all up. She'd have to maintain her bins and separate them all and get them all in bags and get them ready so that every month or so we would go to the recycling center. And she would have to stand in line with all of the folks doing the bottles and cans. And that includes some of the... Uh, uh, some of the interesting characters that might be homeless or otherwise just looking for money for, uh, mm, let's just say, nefarious reasons or unfortunate reasons. Let's say unfortunate reasons. So she'd have to stand in line with some very colorful characters occasionally in the heat of the sun because I wasn't going to do it for her. I would stand with her, but she carried her bags up and she might have been six, six, seven, eight years old. She's standing there in line at the recycling center waiting to get her bottles and cans done and she'd load them in the basket or in the bins together we'd do it all together and then she would receive her receipt for her bottles and cans and we would go into the store and she would cash out sometimes she'd get 10 15 dollars she has a lot of money for a little kid and i told her she could have half of it she could do whatever she wanted with half of it sometimes she would buy candy and toys and stuff right there in line at the grocery store and then we would drive over to the credit union and she would put the rest of it. We'd walk up to the teller window and she'd put the rest of it in her savings account. That's it. That's, that's one of the ways that by example, she learned the value of actually saving a few dollars because she had money. She actually raised up several hundreds and hundreds of dollars in her little savings account. It grew up very nicely. So once again, teaching your kids by example in the, in, in that situation, Man, could if Madeline could skip the recycling center job, heck yeah, she would skip it, right? Wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all skip that labor-intensive, standing in the hot sun job, whatever it is, right? Myself as a kid, my parents did not have a lot of money, so my jobs included mowing lawns, cleaning out, uh, cleaning out the sheep shed on the farm. Oh my gosh, I still have vivid memories of turning over the soil for the first time in the sheep barn. There was about three feet that had never been cleaned out of that thing, and it was epic, epically bad. But I earned a few bucks. My dad dropped me off at the farm with a bottle of water, a big jug of water, and said, I'll be back, and you better have it done. And I did. I got it done. I cleaned it out. I got it done, worked most of the afternoon. And I worked. I mowed lawns. I went to the golf course when it rained. In where I grew up as a kid, it rained a lot in the summer times. And I would collect big, giant nightcrawler worms. And I would package them up. And I would go to the end of the my street on the weekends. And I would put out my worms in a in a little stand that my dad and I built to sell worms to fishermen. And fishermen would leave money in the can, and I would pick up my money at the end of a school day, and I would make uh, you know good money for a kid back then, just selling worms to the fishermen on their way to the lakes, right? I worked. I just I learned the value of working. That's the thing. I learned by example because my mom and dad were extremely hardworking people, and if you're not a hardworking person. It's going to be a challenge to set that as an example, which then leads to how do you save, right? Savings generally comes after you have earned a value for work. If you're not teaching them hard work, ugh, that's a challenge, right? Dan's next point was paying an honest tithe. For those who have faith, and the faith encourages a tithe, right? Service to others. That's my thing. Right. With my family dynamics, as I mentioned earlier, t 
tithing was not always an easy thing to teach. It was tough. It was challenging with all the family dynamics, right? Because Madeline got mixed messages, all right? So what she really learned from me was service to others. Service to others was something my daughter and I could do together, something whether she liked it or not, right? We would go and help families move. We'd be there on a Saturday morning, Friday afternoon. We'd be loading up boxes, helping people move. We would do service projects together. We would go and clean up a local church parking lot. If I found $20 in a parking lot, Madeline and I would turn back around and we would head back into the store so that she could see doing what was right. Turn that back in with my name on it to say, look, Madeline, I don't know if somebody doesn't come to get this $20. We can come back and maybe maybe we'll pick it back up again. But right now we're going to see if we can find the owner of this $20 bill. And teach that example. Whenever we saw a police officer or soldier at the mall or an airport, me and Madeline would go over and say thank you. Thank you for your service. And Madeline was taught to shake their hand. Right? That's the value of service. So tithes and offerings, absolutely. In my case, it was to teach her the value of service and an offering in that way. Okay? Focus on the future is Dan's next point. Okay, focus on the future. And I'm going to actually wrap it up with this one because timeline, I'm actually getting a text from my wife saying, hey, I'm leaving in a minute. You're going to come say goodbye. Yes, I am. I'm not going to miss it. Right. I don't want to get in trouble. (laughs) But here's the next one. We'll finish up with this. Focusing on the future. Dan writes, selecting the right career choice. Oh, that is a big one for me. Man, that has changed a lot. As as Madeline has grown up for me, that has changed a lot. Selecting the right career choice, right? This has evolved as Madeline has grown up. She's going on a particular path right now into the medical sciences, maybe physician's assistant, something like that. But teaching your kids to work is the best way to prepare them for a career path. I'm going to get kind of excited about this because I'll tell you, look around you. Look at how many kids nowadays don't know how to mow the lawn. Are you kidding me? They don't even know how to mow the lawn. They don't know how to change the oil in a car. They don't know how to change a tire. I tell you, kids don't even know how to really properly wash a car for that matter right? Because where I live in Southern California, oh, no, no, we don't do that. We, we go to Jiffy Lube. We go to the car wash place and spend 30 bucks on a car wash while our kids sit there and play video games on our phones, on their phones, right? Teaching your kids to work is the best way to prepare them for whatever career path they're going on. If they don't know what it's like to do manual labor, for example, they will never be ready for even the most menial cubicle work, right? How about this? If they don't know how to mow the lawn or how hard it is to dig a ditch, they won't appreciate their first cubicle job because a cubicle job doesn't require you to be out in the sun at 105 degrees digging a ditch, right? So teaching your kids the value of hard work the, really, the value of work is so important. In my book, I think it's just absolutely imperative. Madeline's friends, my daughter's friends, called her, listen to this, called her Matarella. Matarella, because I made her mow the lawn. I made her plant in the garden and weed the garden. I made her scrub the bathroom floors. I made her learn how to change the oil. I made her actually learn how to wash a car properly, right? These days, listen to this. These days, a skilled welder or a helicopter pilot can make as much or more than a family doctor. These days... A heavy equipment manuf- a heavy equipment mechanic, somebody who works on large tractors, can make more money than a doctor. Hear me, folks. That is a big change that is coming, that is already in motion right now. Skilled labor. 
People who can work with their hands are in short supply, and therefore they are getting paid extremely well. I have a friend who comes to my car show. He is a highly skilled welder. He's almost 60 years old, highly skilled welder. He makes enough money to comfortably drive his dream sports car. Very expensive, but he makes enough money to comfortably afford his dream car because highly skilled welders in his field are in short supply because nowadays kids don't even know how to weld. They don't know how to woodwork. They don't know how to mow a darn lawn. It's crazy, folks. So focusing on the future and teaching your kids an actual value of work and teaching them to work will really prepare them to be able to work. Whatever their career choice is going to be, they will be ready for whatever comes if they know the value of hard work. And they can also appreciate perhaps how nice it is to do the job that they ultimately end up in someday. That's the reason, for example, that I go back to Walmart every year day after Thanksgiving on Black Friday. Those of you who listen to the show and know me, I worked uh, nine years managing Walmart stores twenty over 20 years ago. Nine years I spent at Wally World, and it was brutal. But it was like management Vietnam and business Vietnam. It's like something different every day. It was all the time something new and challenging and something bad, something, oh, it was, you name it. It was a lesson in business management that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else. And yet, I go there on Black Friday every year to walk around the store and I leave to remember that as difficult as it might be sometimes to be self-employed, to be a financial planner, to you know insert whatever challenging thing might be in my life today, I walk the Walmart store on Black Friday to remember that I don't have to be there on Black Friday working. I know the value of that work has taught me to appreciate where I am today. So that's where I'm going to leave it today. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. That, And I've got a lot more from Dan for the next show uh, and maybe another one after that. I really appreciate the uh, questions. Please keep them coming. You can email me suggestions for the show, questions, and feedback to Craig, K-R-A-I-G, at Craig Strom, S-T-R-O-M dot com. I super appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. I will talk to you again soon. Welcome to the Personal Pension Radio Podcast, where it's all about helping you... Thank you for listening to the Personal Pension Radio Podcast. If you missed anything during the show, that's okay. We took the notes for you. Check the show notes for links, offers, and a full transcript. And don't forget to head over to personalpensionradio.com and download your free retirement income report. While you are there, we would appreciate some iTunes love. Please leave us a fantastic rating on iTunes by going to personalpensionradio slash iTunes. Thanks again for listening. Now for the disclosure. <clears throat> Information presented is for educational purposes only and is not intended for solicitation, sale or purchase of any security or financial product. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and your tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed here. The term personal pension refers to a marketing name designed to educate future retirees and retirees about the economic principles behind creating their own pension-like income. The term personal pension is not intended to be confused with a defined benefit pension plan offered by an employer or by a government entity.